welcome to Lake City. We're glad you're here. Would you stand as we worship this morning? We're going to be reminded of who God is, what he's done.
on, church. There's freedom in this place this morning. Amen. Come on, we got lots of reasons to praise today. Come on, there's things in each and every one of our lives that sometimes we can feel that's missing. And I just want to encourage you, if you walked in here with any of that this morning, I would encourage you, just let God fill whatever that is. He wants to make you whole. He doesn't want you broken. He's a healer. He's here to make you whole. Come on, if there's a situation or a circumstance in your life that you don't think is, is good, he's good. He's good yesterday, today, tomorrow. If there's a situation or circumstance in your life where you're feeling alone, isolated. Scripture says he's with you and he will not leave you. He will not forsake you. Come on, there's a lot of things in our life that we don't have control of, but he's in control. He's on the throne this morning he will continue to be forever and always. So come on, let's sing out of that praise. When I'm at my end, you're just getting started. When I hit a wall, you just walk through. When I face a mountain, you are the maker, so it's got to move. When I'm out of faith, you are still faithful. When I'm at my worst, you are still good. All of my questions, you are the answer. It all points to you. Cause you're the God of the breakthrough. When I'm breaking down, you'll be working away. But there's no way out this one thing.
Great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven, spoke your name into the night, and through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living
Let's pray together. Church, Jesus, we know that you are here. It says in your word, where two or three are gathered in a name, that you are here with us, and we know that you are here and you are present right now. And God, you are our living hope. We celebrate that today. And so God, whether we walked in, kind of limping in emotionally and we're wounded, but we're here, or we had an amazing week, no matter where we're at, Lord, you are ready to meet us today. You're ready to speak to our hearts today, God. And we are ready and we're expectant and we're excited. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Before you guys take a seat, greet someone around you. Say hey to someone around you really quick. Well, good morning. Welcome to Lex City Church. My name's Zach. I'm one of the pastors. So welcome those of you watching online at LexCity.tv as well. If you're here in Lexington, isn't this weather just been incredible the last couple of days? Come on. Enjoy it. This is probably this is probably it, everybody. It's gonna get cold, all right? But we're glad you guys are here. It's gonna be an amazing day worshiping together. We are continuing a series that we're doing called Elephants in the Room, Hurts That We Don't Talk About. If it's your first time here, we're so glad you joined us. You can go to Lexi.info, click on that says new here. We'd love to give you more information about our church. We'll just send you an email, ways you can get involved, ways you can stay connected, all that God is doing here in the life of our church. And so we have this thing that we do about four or five times a year. It's called Discover Lex City. It's our staff's like favorite nights of the year because we get to kind of host you guys. Anybody that wants to come and be a part of it, maybe you've been coming to the church for a while, but you don't know much about it, you haven't taken the next step yet, or maybe you just got here. We do this thing called Discover Lake City, and we meet on a Tuesday night, and we give you free dinner, free child care, so hashtag date night, all right? And we get together, and we just kind of tell you more about the mission and vision and values of our church, and ways that you can get involved, ways to get connected. So we encourage you guys, get signed up for the next one. It's coming up November 1st in just a couple of weeks. You can go to Lexa.info and sign up for that there as well. And uh, as we continue to worship, we're going to worship through our giving right now, and we try to make it easy for you guys to give. You can give by going to Lexi.info, clicking on the word give right there. You can set up a one-time or recurring monthly donation. And when you guys give, you're being obedient to God. It's an act of worship, but you're also giving towards things like Spooktacular. We do an event every year during the Halloween season called Spooktacular, and it's just kind of a thing we throw for our community. They can come and be a part of our church. They come in our parking lot. It's incredible. It's, there's just all these people dressed up. There's all these fun things going on. They get free candy. And we do that not just to give away candy, but because when someone comes on the campus for the first time, then they may come again later when they're walking through a really hard time in their life, but they remember this church that threw this thing for them in the community, and they may come and God may do something incredible in their life because of that. So that's the real reason that we do this event. So you can get involved in three different ways. You can register and just come. We have almost 1,500 people already registered. It's gonna be a really big event next week. It's gonna be really fun. We also need volunteers, so you can come, bring your car, uh, kind of dress up the trunk of, the, of your car, dress up yourself. Do that with your life group, do that with your family, however you want to do it, but you can register that all on Lexi.info. You can also donate candy. We have bins at both entrance. You can bring candy and bring it next week. It's going to be a lot of fun because it is next Sunday, right after church from 5 to 8 that night. But don't take my word for it. Take it from one of the kids, a spectacular expert right here.
Daphne is a tough act to follow. I feel like maybe she should give the message today. <laughs> be a lot more entertaining. Um, well, a few weeks back, Pastor Brian asked if I could meet with him about an upcoming series called Elephant in the Room about hurts that we don't talk about. And I texted back, unfortunately, I have some experience with hurts and pains, to which he replied, I thought I'd ask the expert. <laughs> and I wrote back and said, I'm honored. Um, I am not an expert on pain. I'm not gonna pretend to be an expert on anything today. Uh, but I do have some experience with being hurt and wounded multiple times. And I have learned that the way that you respond to wounding and hurt really can begin to set the trajectory of your life. Now for the sake of transparency, I should also say that I personally have been walking through one of the hardest seasons of my life. This past year has been one of hit after hit after hit. Um, as one of my friends says, it's a lot. Uh, my mom always says that someone has it better than you and someone has it worse and that's still true. And no matter how many hard things are in my life, I still have more to be grateful for than to complain about. But we have been hurting and not just me, um, but more recently my children and I've been carrying their pain as well. So I want you to know that I'm not gonna share or suggest anything with you today that God is not holding me accountable for already in my life. We really are in this healing thing together. So I love history, I think maybe I've told you that before, and I wanted to know the history of the phrase, the elephant in the room, because let's be honest, it's weird. Why an elephant? I mean, there's other big things, like why not the Eiffel Tower? in the room, or the semi-truck, or maybe a woolly mammoth. We could have gone way back. Uh, so I looked it up on Google, the expert on everything, and found a website called thegrammarist.com, and this is what they said. They said that in 1935, this phrase kind of entered the scene in America because there was a Broadway musical called Jumbo, where a character walks an elephant across the stage and crosses paths with a police officer, and the police officer says, what are you doing with that elephant? And the character says, what elephant? And just keeps walking the elephant across the stage. So that's where most people think it came from. At that time, it just meant something really big that didn't belong. But around the 1950s is when it started to mean what it means now, which is something really obvious that we choose to ignore because it's too uncomfortable to deal with. So today, the elephant in the room um, is that we have a significant part to play in our wounding and in our healing. And if you'd like to follow along or you're a note taker, you can go to lexcity.info and click on message notes and it'll have all the scriptures and main ideas from today. So I know when I say our part that some of you bristle a little bit, feel a little defensive, like, hey, wait a minute. I thought we were talking about hurts that happened to me. Why do I have to own anything? And so I wanna be clear what our part is that I'm talking about today. I don't mean that you're responsible for your initial wound or your hurt. I mean that you're responsible and I'm responsible for how we handle it and heal after it happens. In the first week of this series, which I encourage you to watch, I encourage you to watch all of them. They have been so good and so helpful and real. But Pastor Brian passed out rocks that had some periods on them and he asked a really important question. He said, what story awaits you on the other side of the period of your pain? And I think that the period as a marker for pain is a really significant one because when we get hurt, it sort of leads us to a stop. There's what we knew before we got hurt and then what we know or are experiencing after it. And Pastor Brian said, we have to acknowledge that we don't have the power to change what hurt us, the period of our pain, but we do have the power to decide what the next sentence will be. And that's our part. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, the reality that we cannot change what hurts us, but we can choose how to live with it. The sentence after the period is the part of the elephant in the room that we can actually do something about. I cannot keep people 
or circumstances from hurting me or causing my pain, but I do get to choose how I live after they do, and so do you. I think it's important to pause here and to take a look at how God himself understands and has experienced pain, and to notice how he wrote the story after he got hurt. One of the first accounts of God's pain um, is in the beginning of the flood account in Genesis 6, and keep in mind, all of God's pain has come from the very human beings that he created to love and know and lead, and we are the ones who have hurt him. But in Genesis 6, it says, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. And the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was greatly troubled. He not only regretted it, he felt it in his heart. It hurt. The book of Hosea gives an account of God's heartbreak over the nation of Israel's unfaithfulness to him. And it says in Hosea 2, I will punish her, meaning the nation of Israel, for the days that she burned incense to the Baals, she decked herself with rings and jewelry and went after her lovers, meaning idols, but me, she forgot. And then again in Hosea 13, God says, I have been the Lord your God ever since you came out of Egypt. You shall acknowledge no God but me, no savior except me. I cared for you in the wilderness, in the land of burning heat. When I fed them, meaning the people in the wilderness, they were satisfied, and when they were satisfied, they became proud. Then they forgot me. God knows what it feels like to be forgotten. And then in John 11, a story we're familiar with and that we've already talked about in this series where Lazarus dies and then Jesus raises him from the dead. But before he raised him, Jesus crosses paths with Mary, the sister of Lazarus. And this is what scripture tells us. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. There's that word again. Jesus wept. There's plenty more examples. Jesus experienced the rejection of being questioned by religious leaders who should have known exactly who he was. He wept over Jerusalem because of their unbelief. He was so distressed and grieved in the Garden of Gethsemane that he sweat blood and asked three times, God, isn't there another way? We have to know that we don't have or follow a God who has no idea what it is to experience pain. And more than that, we have a God who became a human being. He is not unacquainted with what it means to be a person and to be hurt by people. We have the one true God who became a man to suffer death for the things that those who wounded him did wrong. God had Jesus endure the greatest pain of all, the cross, because the ones who had hurt him needed a way to stay in relationship with him. And so he sent a savior in the form of his one and only son to die a death he didn't deserve in our place. So when we talk about unfair hurts, wrongs, injustices, and pain, God gets it. But the sentence that he wrote after his pain is one of victory, is one of grace, and one of invitation to anyone to come, to all of us who have wounded him, and to be healed by his stripes. And the good news is, that's a standing invitation. The sentences that we write after experiencing a wound determine whether or not God can use our pain, or whether or not we just stay the same. So what are our options after we get hurt, after the period of our pain? There's some fairly common defaults that we often go to when we get hurt. Some of us turn the period of our pain into a pit. It becomes a black hole that we stay in. We just sort of sink into our pain and grope around in the dark. And because of that, we can't move forward and we don't see clearly. And because all we feel surrounded by is our pain, oftentimes we turn to distractions or things to get relief. 
we think it will help us deal with the wound. The lie that we believe is, I can deal with my pain. But the sentence after the period of your pain, when it turns into a pit, usually becomes, I just want some relief. For some, that relief comes in the form of alcohol, or drug use, or people. For others, that takes on the form of working too much, staying busy so you don't have to feel it, or just binge watching lots of TV. Either way, all of these distractions that we turn to for relief always come up short. And many times, they actually multiply the pain that we have. And we justify these things because we say things like, I deserve a break. I need this. This is so hard. I just want a minute where it doesn't hurt so badly. My sister got married, and three weeks later, we had her funeral. Her wedding and her funeral were all within a month's time. And that pain was so overwhelming. And I remember how clearly it was when it came to me. I totally get why people drink or do drugs because I would give anything to not feel this pain, even if it was for just a little while. The relief from the pain can so easily become the thing that we seek rather than God in the pain. And Hear me, it makes sense. The relief from the pain often feels more tangible to turn to. It's something or someone. Also, the truth is, it takes longer to heal than it does to find a distraction. So relief not only seems more tangible at times, but it also feels like a faster way out of the pain. Because when we turn to God, we don't often feel like this immediate relief from our pain. And so many times, I remember in hard seasons in my life, people would say, just give your pain to God. Just give your pain to God. And I would think, man, that sounds nice. What on earth do you mean? <laughs> I'm gonna need a list. Because how do you give your pain to God? And again, I'm not an expert on anything, but I have come to believe that all that means is that I continue to set the burden of it, the heaviness of it on God, that I cast my cares on him because he cares for me. It's kind of like a game of hot potato. Do y'all know what hot potato is? It's like, I feel it, I release it. I feel it, I release it. I feel it, I release it. Because if I hold on to it too long, I'm gonna get burned. And you just have to do it over and over and over again, and eventually the pain will get better. I heard a pastor teach and say once, if you pray and still feel burdened afterwards, you haven't surrendered anything. You've just had a gripe session. And I was like, oh, that hurts, man. It's true, but oh, it hurts, it hurts so bad. But when we make choices, to distract ourselves, to relieve our pain, and we turn to other things, we end up having to own the responsibility of those things that we chose. And so now, we don't only have to own the sentence after the pain, but now we have to own all these things that we did to add to it. It's almost like we've tried to claw our way out of this pit, and in the process, we have just drug in all kinds of dirt and debris and things, and eventually we look around we're like, in some ways, I feel like there's more pain than there even was from the initial wound. Psalm 38 recalls moments when King David was overwhelmed by sin and pain. And I wanted to read the whole thing to you, but it's 22 verses long. That felt like a lot. So I encourage you to read Psalm 37 and Psalm 38 for yourself at some point this week. But I'm gonna read you part of it so that you see how King David described it. it. says, Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Your arrows have pierced me and your hand has come down on me. Because of your wrath, there's no health in my body. There's no soundness in my bones. Because of my sin, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain and there's no health in my body. I'm feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. 
All my longings lie open before you, Lord. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart pounds, my strength fails me. Even the light has gone from my eyes. My friends and companions avoid me because of my wounds. My neighbors stay far away. Aren't you so glad that scripture does not try to avoid our hurts, but that many times it actually gives us words to describe them? The sinful things that we turn to to relieve our pain will not lift the burden of them. It will most likely just add to it. Relief temporarily helps us forget about the pain, but it's not permanent. And that's because relief is not healing. Turning to God in our pain is where we can find real healing. The hurts will never be okay, but with God we can get okay and we can get well if we'll choose to turn to him when we've been hurt. Now not all of us turn the period of our pain into a pit. Some of us get angry when we get hurt and we lash out and that period of our pain becomes a stone that we regularly pick up and chuck at other people. And we justify this by saying, can't everybody see how hurt I am? I can't help it that it hurts them. This is what I need for me. When the period of our pain becomes a stone that we throw, now we are not only experiencing the hurt, but we are hurting others. And ultimately, we're hurting ourselves because as we do this, community isolates itself further and further from us. Think about verse 11, where it said, my friends and companions avoid me because of my wounds. My neighbors stay far away. But there's yet another group of people, and this group of people tend to want to avoid the pain. And so they like to turn the period of the pain into a comma or a semicolon and just keep rolling like nothing happened. And the lie here is that if I ignore the pain, it's gonna go away and not bother me. But the problem is, it will. It will come up at some point, no matter how far down you try to bury that thing. Years ago, I had a friend and she did not wanna go to counseling. She kind of felt like she needed it but was really reluctant to go. And she kept saying, are they gonna make me like talk about all the things that have hurt me like for my whole life because that sounds terrible. I don't think that's gonna help me at all. And as she was saying that, the Lord dropped this phrase into my head and I opened my mouth and I said it to her and it was, You do not have to drag the bottom of the lake, but you do have to address the floaters. And my first thought was, God said floaters. (laughs) That's funny. And my second thought was, that's so good. Some of the things that we think we've buried, they float to the surface and they're in our eyesight every day. And no matter how much we ignore them, they do not go away. Science and God's wisdom are clear that avoided pain will eventually come to the surface in your physical health, in your mental health, and just in your life in general. I think that's why when we confess our sins to one another, we get healed. Because we bring those things to the surface, we look at them, we face them, we turn from them. And then they can get healed and buried for good. And that's what God wants to do with our hurts. Now none of these paths, not the pit, not turning it into a stone, and not acting like it didn't happen, work to heal us, and we have a God who wants to heal us. Remember that the sentences we write after experiencing a wound determine whether or not God can use my pain, or whether or not we just stay the same. And when we don't own our part, our responsibility to obey God in how we write the sentences after the pain. We begin to add pain to our lives, but we also begin to harden our hearts. We harden our hearts when we build walls to protect ourselves from getting hurt again. We harden our hearts when we become defensive of our hurt and it becomes part of our identity because we won't release it and heal it. 
And we harden our hearts when we make poor choices just to relieve or distract us from the hurt. And all of these things over time make our hearts harder and harder. Simply put, we harden our hearts from sin. The Bible says in Hebrews 3, so as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray. They have not known my ways. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You see, the enemy will kick you while you are down and while you are hurting. He will convince you that the way out of your place of pain is to take care of you, put up walls, make any choices that make you feel better. But he's deceitful. He will be the first to tell you what you deserve and why you should choose things that relieve you on your own terms. And then he'll be the first to accuse you of doing them. He beckons and then he points. That's our enemy. And he wants you to have a hardened heart because like we saw in Hebrews, that's a sinful, unbelieving heart turned away from God and that is the enemy's ultimate goal. These moments after we get hurt are moments when we have to decide what we believe about the goodness of God. Is he good? Because these things, they're so bad. Our hearts have to answer this question though. In order for us to trust him to help heal us, we have to turn towards God, even with our questions, even if we're saying, are you good? because that keeps us from turning away and hardening our hearts. Proverbs 28, 14 says, blessed is the one who always trembles before God, but whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. The other question that we have to answer is the one that Jesus asked the crippled man by the pool when he leaned down and said, do you want to be well? And I'm asking you the same question today. Do you want to be well? The next sentence that we write after the period of our pain becomes a very direct reflection of the condition of our hearts. Like the sentences that God wrote after the pain of the cross, ours should be full of victory, grace to ourselves and to others, and to an invitation for God to come and work it for our good and to use our pain to make us more like him and also to make us into who he created us to be. And here's the thing, you do not have to enjoy suffering and be like, yay, I'm becoming like Jesus. You don't have to do that, but it is still your best option to let God do the work in you that he wants to do. And we're gonna look at this clay pot and this lump of clay. Both are clay, but they have taken on different forms through different processes. So for the sake of analogy, the clay or the pot is going to represent your heart and I'm gonna climb the ladder, not too high because I'm afraid of heights, and drop each of these. And that drop is going to represent the hurt or the wound. And I chose the ladder because I don't know about you, but my hurts feel really big. And I felt like we needed to drop these things from higher. So watch what happens when I drop each of these things. And pray I don't fall. Okay. And drop the clay pot first. Okay, now the lump of clay. 
This is where I get to get some of my anger out. Okay. Now notice that the clay pot, which represents a hardened heart, has broken into multiple pieces. And it's not impossible to put back together. God can do anything. But it is gonna take a lot more work. There's the gathering of the pieces, the finding of the little bitty shards, all the sticky glue, and then in the end, you're still gonna have a pot that shows a lot of marks from the fall. And the truth is, that pot is never gonna be as strong as it was before. But look at the clay. Clearly, it's had a hit. It bears marks too but it's in one piece. It didn't fall apart. And something can be made from it in God's hands. It can be turned into whatever God wants. It can even become something better than the lump of clay that it started out as. But the clay pot pretty much can just go back to the form that it had. Now think about subsequent hits because Jesus was clear in this world, we will have trouble. So we're not done taking the hits until we go to be with the Lord. Imagine if I had glued this whole pot back together and I just continued to drop it, glue it back together, drop it. I mean, eventually this thing is toast. No matter how much glue you have, it is barely holding it together. But this lump of clay, even if I turned it into something pretty, I could drop it over and over again, and it would not break. It would just be a lump of clay that God could mold something beautiful out of. I understand why you've hardened your heart. I understand that it feels safer. You feel like you're protecting yourself. But I wanna tell you the truth. You're not safer when you harden your heart. You're easier to break. Today we have a choice to make. You see, our pain does matter to God. Psalm 56, eight says, record my misery. List my tears in your scroll. Are they not in your record? And another translation says, you keep track of all my sorrows. All my tears are in your bottle. You've recorded each one in your book. You can stay soft in his hands because he knows everything and he won't forget. And he keeps a record of your pain even though he doesn't keep a record of your sin. We best guard our hearts when we put them in his hands. It's the safest place and it's a place where we can become something beautiful. So today when you came in, you received a rock, just like you did in week one. If you did not, we have some at the foot of the cross that you can pick up. And today that rock represents your heart or the places of it that have become hard because of the hurts that have happened to you or because of choices you've made trying to recover from them. And you're gonna get to make an exchange today. You're gonna get to come to the foot of the cross, which makes all healing possible, and which makes all trust in God possible, because it's the place where we remember what he was willing to do for us. And on each of these bags is Isaiah 64, eight, that says, yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. If you're ready to stop hardening your heart and to soften it, then you're ready to come up here and make the exchange, to lay down your rock and to pick up this bag of clay that you can take with you today as a reminder that you've chosen to keep your heart soft. If you're ready to have God make something beautiful from your pain, you're ready to make this exchange. If you just know that doing it your way is not working, you're ready to make this exchange. It's worth a shot. So we're gonna stand together.
And as we do, we're gonna let God examine our hearts. You are not about to tell God something he doesn't know. He knows everything and he loves you and he wants you to trade this for this. So let's let God talk to us about our hearts during this next song and let's be brave enough to decide we wanna make the exchange and come up here and grab this as a sign of that decision.